Um, good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, Holland Park's Ecology Centre's talk. This evening we're talking about the plight of the bumblebee. We're very lucky to be joined by Nikki Gammons from the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, who's one of the project officers there, and she'll be talking for about 45 minutes to an hour about bumblebees. So feel free to put any questions in the chat function. Uh, a bit of housekeeping there. If you've not been on a Teams Live event, before. Um, you can't interact in the same way as a Zoom call, but you can put questions in the Q&A and we can ask them at the end. There's an option to put captions on and the recording of this talk will be made afterwards. This forms a series of talks um, promoting the Bumblebee and the Bee Superhighway, and I'll talk about that a bit more in detail at the end of the talk. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Nikki. So Nikki, thanks very much for joining us. I'm looking forward to your talk about bumblebees. Thank you. Unmute yourself, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Can you unmute yourself? Cool. Yeah, done it. Sorry. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll re. Can everybody still see the slideshow? There we go. OK, everyone, so um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Trevor and Kensington and Chelsea uh, Borough Council for inviting me along this evening. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is all about our bumblebees and the importance of our bumblebees um, and also about our other bee species as well. So first of all, I'm going to give an introduction to the three types of bees that we actually have a little bit then about the similarities and the differences between them their importance, their conservation, and really about their decline as well. And most importantly, I'm going to talk about on how we can actually help our bees as well. So specifically how we can garden for them. So whether this is in our own individual gardens or whether it's in any outdoor space. So some of the things that we can really do to help them. I'll then go give you um, a brief introduction to the identification of our bumblebees. So I will mainly focus on the most common species that you will see in and around your gardens and in an urban area. I'll then go on to talk a little bit about the project that I work on, which is based in South Kent and South East uh, Sussex, which is the reintroduction of a short haired bumblebee. So this is trying to attempt to reintroduce one of our extinct UK species. But there's lots of sort of messages that we can take from this, uh, no matter where you are, uh, to sort of take forward and use as well in your local area. So there are three different types of bees. And these are solitary bees, our honeybees and our bumblebees. Now, what all of our bees have in common is that they all carry and collect pollen and they are also all vegetarians. So they collect all of the food that they need from flowers. So they collect the pollen, which is very protein rich, and they take the nectar from the flowers. They drink that uh, by their long tongue. And then that is the sugar store that they use to be able to power their flight and energize uh, their flight. Now in the UK, we actually have around about uh, 274 species here. Now the vast majority of our bees are actually what we call solitary bees. So as opposed to the honeybees, which I know you had a course on uh, before, and as opposed to our bumblebees, the solitary bees are just males and females. So they don't have a queen and they don't have the worker caste. It is just males and females. So first of all, the males will emerge out of where they've been nesting and they will hate, wait around the areas where then the females will then emerge. Those males will mate with the female and the female will then look for somewhere suitable to go and lay her eggs. So this can be in the south facing side of our um, buildings in old mortar, particularly lime mortar. It can be in our front lawns, particularly where um, it's, it's a lot of bare ground present, or it can be in sandy slopes, uh, ditch banks, uh, any areas where there's a bit of bare ground and it's easy for those females to dig. Once that female finds that area, what she would do is lay one egg and then she'll provision that egg with pollen and nectar. And that can take her anything between 60 to 100 trips. So once she's fed that egg, she then seals off the end of the cell. She will then lay another egg and she will provision that again with nectar and pollen. And that is the level of maternal care within our female solitary bees. 
All they do is provide them with the nectar and pollen that the egg needs. Many of our solitary bees are also quite short uh, time on the wing as well. Many of them may only be about eight weeks. Some may live up to about 12 weeks. So it's quite short and many of our solitary bees tend to be quite specialised in what they forage on as well. So many of them may only forage on between one to three or four uh, different uh, species. Our most common ones that we find in our gardens are the ones that are more generalist and will forage on a wider range. So I've got three pictures at the bottom of the slide there, and these are examples of some of our different solitary bees. So some of the ones that you might see in and around your garden at this time of year, in the bottom left there, I have a leaf cutter bee. And you know if you've got a leaf cutter bee because it cuts a perfect semicircle out of your rose bush, and it is using those leaves to divide up between the cells where they've laid the eggs. The one in the middle we call a red mason bee, and that uses mud to divide up between the cells. And the one at the far right there is a tawny mining bee. So that's a mining bee that buries down into the ground. So that's a brief overview of who our solitary bees are. Next type of bee is our honey bee. Now there's just one species in Europe and there are about eight to 12 worldwide. Most of these occurring in and around Asia. Now the difference between a honey bee and compared to uh, a bumblebee and a solitary bee is they're actually not classed as native. So um, our, our solitary bees and bumblebees are classed as native, but the honeybees have been introduced to large parts of the world, not just for the pollination service, but also for the products that you can get from the hive as well, such as the honey, the beeswax and the royal jelly. Now, honeybees form a much more complex society when we compare those with the solitary bee and with the bumblebee. So you have the queen and you have the worker cast. Now, the queen will only leave her hive twice in her life cycle. The first time she leaves is her nuptial flight. So she will disperse away from a hive, emit a pheromone, which is um, just a scent to attract the males. And in honeybees, we call them drones, the males. She will mate with those drones and then she returns back into the hive. The only other time she leaves is when she is usurped by the production of a new queen. So the queen of a honeybee never goes out and forages for the colony and doesn't have any pollen baskets. So it doesn't have any adaptations on its body to be able to carry pollen. Now, queen honeybees can live for between three to five years, but they will normally be usurped over that time. So when a queen is usurped, she will take with her between two to three thousand workers and they will go off and find somewhere else to find a nest. And that's called a swarm. So a swarm of honeybees is the old queen leaving and looking for somewhere else suitable to find a nest. Last type of bee is the big fluffy furry ones. And these are our bumblebees. So we did have in, in the UK recorded 27 different species of bumblebees, but some of these have now actually gone extinct. So we now have 24 species that are present. So like with the honeybees, you do have one queen and you have the worker cast. Now at this time of year, you might have seen really big bumblebees flying around and maybe hovering over the surface of the ground. So the queens at the moment have emerged from hibernation where they were pre-mated before they went in. They then go over the surface of the ground and look for somewhere to find their nests. Once they've found that area, she, the queen, will then keep going out and foraging for the nest. Once the production of her workers turn into adults and they start to emerge, the queen then remains within that colony. So the queen will actually forage for the startup and set up that colony for the first six weeks. The workers, once they are produced, will then replace her from doing that. So workers are just mini versions of the queen. They are females, and that's true for all of our social insects, whether that's ants, bees or wasps. All workers are female. The difference between a queen and a worker is that workers do not have fully developed ovaries. So queen bumblebees can live for a maximum of one year, but the majority of their life is spent in hibernation. The life cycle of a colony is only between about three to five months and the majority of our bumblebees it's around about three and a half months. At the end of the colony cycle of bumblebees the original queen all of her workers and the males will die just the new generation of queens will survive. So at the bottom of the pitch there I've got a few different types of bumblebees so many of them are the characteristic have a white tail with um, yellow and black stripes 
but a lot of them have a variety of different colours and it is this variety of colours that we use to then tell them apart. So then going on to compare a little bit more between honeybees, bumblebees and solitary bees. So as I said, honeybees are classed as a domesticated species and they have been introduced to large parts of the world, whereas bumblebees and solitary bees are classed as native. So one species of honeybee in the UK. Now of our bumblebees, as I said, we did have recorded 27, but three of these are now no longer recorded. 18 of the ones that we do record um, are called social species, but the remaining six are called cuckoo bumblebees. Now, just like the bird, the female of a cuckoo bumblebee will go inside the nest of its host, will either kill, dislodge her or make her subdominum, will then lay her eggs inside that nest and let the workers of the host nest rear them. So a little bit of a cheater of the system. In a honeybee hive, there can be 50, 100,000 workers, so a very large colony size. We compare that to our bumblebees and they have on average about 150 workers with just one species getting up to about four, 500. Honeybees have also evolved to be able to communicate with each other where to go out and find forage. And this is called the waggle dance. So when a worker leaves the hive, they will basically recruit themselves to a good food resource, come back, and then they would do a Pacific dance and they would move their abdomen at a Pacific angle according to the sun and they can also communicate how far to travel as well. So they can actively recruit fellow workers to a good resource. In the case of our bumblebees, they don't do any dancing. So basically when a worker comes back with pollen and nectar, it's merely a demonstration that there is food out there, but they can't communicate where to go and find it. So why do honeybees store that large amount of honey? Well, a large percentage of that hive is going to survive over the winter months, perhaps 50, 60 percent. Of course, temperatures are very low. There's not much forage available. So they store the honey as the food source to get them through. Now, bumblebees obviously collect nectar. We don't call it honey because they don't process it in the same way that honeybees do, but they will only store enough for the next three to five days. When a queen goes in to overwinter into hibernation, she takes no food with her whatsoever. She relies entirely on her fat reserves. So even though bumblebees do collect and store nectar, it's only for the next three to five days. Now bees in the UK, and this is true for the rest of Europe across our Northern hemisphere, the, the native range largely of our bumblebees, but all of our bees really are being affected and have declined. Bumblebees and solitary bees, it is largely due to loss of foraging habitat. There's some other reasons for that as well, which I'll talk about a bit later. Honeybees, it's mainly diseases that are affecting the hive. Varomite, American, European fowl brood, colony collapse disease. Now, the majority of honeybee diseases do not affect our bumblebees or our solitary bees because of their different life cycles. Another important difference between our three types of bee is also the length of their tongues. So as a general rule, our solitary bees have a short tongue length, honeybees are in the middle with a medium tongue length, and our bumblebees we then divide into, uh, into short tongues and into long tongues. Now that variety of tongue lengths that our bees have means they can pollinate a wide variety of different agricultural crops and wildflowers. So of course they're very important to conserve all of these different types of bee because they can do a completely different array of pollination from each other. Now I've got a little video here that I'd like to, to share with everybody and this is something that people might be seeing at the moment. So our queen bees are out, we've had quite a slow start to the spring and this bee here is foraging on white dead nettle. On its a uh, hind leg, you can see it's got a pollen basket full of white pollen. That's the colour of uh, the pollen from this species. And you can see here, this video has actually slowed down considerably. Bumblebees can beat their wing beat up to 200 beats per second. Now to be able to do that, they have to have a large sugar concentration. And nectar is the perfect source for that because it can be anything, a, a flower's a nectar, from 60 to 90% sugar. But even if they have a full honey stomach, it only powers them for a maximum of 40 minutes of flight. Okay, so they need to forage continuously. And that's why it's so important to have a continuation of forage 
for our bees to be able to visit flower to flower. So they don't have to fly too far between the flower resources. So just to summarise then, our bees in the UK. So we had 278 native bee species. So honeybees, um, as I said, are not classed as native to the UK. They have been introduced, whereas we did have recorded 27 different species of bumble and 250 solitary bees. Now in the UK, one in three of our bee species is classed as rare or threatened. And this means that their populations have declined by 60, sometimes even over 90%. In the case of bumbles, we've had two species that have actually gone extinct. And we have a further one that is no longer recorded. It was actually only temporarily recorded in Kent for, for one year. So we class that as a failed colonization as opposed to an establishment and an extinction. And we have a further seven, which we class as BAP species biodiversity action plan. So of course our bees of high ecological importance. Why is that? Of course, we know about the importance of pollination of our agricultural crops. Not just bees do pollination, moths, butterflies, hoverflies, beetles, wasps will also contribute towards pollination, but bees are responsible for the vast amount of this. And they will pollinate 84% of our highest value crops and 80% of our wildflowers. So of course they have importance ecologically and economically as well. And this is estimated to be worth anything between 560 to 800 million pounds a year. Now bumblebees do something quite special as well in terms of when they're visiting certain flowers and in terms of their pollination. And it's something we call buzz pollination or sonication. So on certain crops, such as tomatoes, the anther, uh, the pollen is held very tightly onto the anther. So when another bee species or another insect species lands on that flower, they actually can't get the pollen off. What a bumblebee will do is land on that flower, unhook their wing muscles, vibrate their whole body. It causes then the anthers to vibrate and the pollen will then drop off. Now, it's only bumblebees that are able to do this sort of across the north, northwest and in Central Europe. Once you get into Southern Europe, there are a few species of solitary bees called carpenter bees that can do this. But it has certainly has particular importance for us here. Now, I've got another little video here just to show you. And this is actually a North American bumblebee species, but it's doing buzz pollination. So this species, this bee, has landed on the flower. She's uncoupled her wing muscles. She's then vibrating her whole body. You can see the anthers are vibrating and you can start to see a little bit of flakes of pollen dropping off. Once the bee then gets the right frequency, you can see there a large amount of pollen dropping off and that's falling onto the body of the bee. Once she's collected that pollen, she will then um, recouple her wing muscles and she will then go on to the next flower or back to her colony. So bumblebees always collect pollen in their, their hind baskets. We call them pollen baskets. And once they've become dust in pollen, they mix with their front legs um, a little bit of nectar and they basically glue it into their, into their pollen baskets. And so it is fixed and it's rigid on their hind legs. So only bumblebees are able to do that across large parts of Europe. So here's a bit of the doom and gloom. So what has been a lot of the things that are affecting really our, our bee populations, but also our other insect pollinators and a lot of our um, countryside, our farm wildlife. Well, in fact, over the last 60 to over 80 years, we've actually lost 97% of our ancient wildflower meadows. So what happened during this time? Well, it was actually during and after the end of the Second World War. And we had the Dig for Victory campaign and we then had a growth in population thereafter. So we needed to intensify our farming. We needed to make sure we were producing more food to feed everyone. But with this came the increased use of pesticides and with fertilisers as well. So a lot of our common land was put into production. It was put into arable production. A lot of hedgerows were taken out and just a lot more intensification across the landscape. 
So the government gave grants to farmers to increase the fertility of the soil. So basically, if you increase the fertility of the soil, you encourage grasses to grow. And those grasses will dominate and outcompete uh, the other wildflowers within that area. So it's a movement of, of hay meadows, and the hay meadows traditionally had a lot of wildflowers in, to more silage. And silage is basically just grass. Increased use of pesticides as well. So after the end of the Second World War, we used to spray with organophosphates at the back of boom sprayers at different times of the day and in quite high dosages as well. Since the 1990s, they've been using a group of chemicals called neonicotinoids or neonics for short. And these are basically a group of chemicals that are used um, to protect the crop from herbivory. And it contains a chemical ni nicotine. So these are normally sprayed and used as a seed coating, so you don't have to do boom sprayers. So once it's sown into the ground and the flower, the crop starts to grow, it will have even amount of the pesticide throughout the flower, so protecting it against a herbivory and attack. Unfortunately, though, it is still found in the pollen and nectar. So those beneficial insects which are foraging on the flowers and pollinating them are also being affected. And we found really with recent studies is that bees that are ingesting these neonicotinoids, it can affect the motor neurons in their brain. So it can make them confused about, uh, uh, it affects their memory. So it can make them confused about how to get back to their hive if they're a honeybee or a colony if they're a bumblebee. So they can become permanently lost or it may just take them much longer to get back. So this is a problem obviously uh, for our bees because it may mean that less food is delivered back into the colony. Now, in the case of bumblebees, the more food that is delivered back, the more of the next generation, the more of the new queens and males are produced. The so less food means less of the next generation. But what can we do to help? Well, there really is lots of solutions that we can do. And the great thing about working with our bees is that everybody can do something to help. And a great thing that we can all do um, is, is help with our gardens or any outdoor space. So whether this is a, a, a park, a recreational area or your own garden, it's something that we can all get involved with and help them with. So traditionally in the UK, we used to have a lot of English cottage gardens, which used a lot of flowers that were derived from our wildflowers. Over the last couple of uh, decades, though, it's been more fashion towards cultivated flowers. Um, cultivation means they're just sort of, if you like, a bit more inbred. So they're breeding them for their, their colour or for their beauty. And often when things become highly cultivated, they will produce very little nectar and no pollen. And a prime example of that is actually the rose. So on the bottom right hand corner, we've got the dog rose there and you can see the pollen and nectar is readily available. But on a highly cultivated rose, you can see that there is no pollen available and very little nectar. So it's about having a choice, a selection of flowers in your area that you're going to have a continuous amount of forage throughout the bee life cycle and just a variety as well. Now at Bumblebee Conservation Trust, we have an application which is called an app called Be Kind. And you can click onto our website, which is www.bumblebeeconservation and you can click on this and it gives you a rating a score of all the things you can put in. So the key thing about our bumblebees as well is providing that continuous uh, variety of forage throughout the whole life cycle. Now in our countryside is actually during April um, to the beginning of May and from the end of August to September where there's a lot of forage that isn't available. So gardens can really make up these resources which means continuation for our bees. So some of the excellent things to plant around now are the flowering currant, the longwort rosemary. Later on through May and June things like comfrey, cotoneaster, pea family and later on during the season, you really can't beat lavender, particularly Old English lavender, fantastic forage for the bees and lots of other insect pollinators as well. So now I'm going to just go through the seasons and sort of give some ideas about what you can plant uh, as well. So you may think, well, winter, there's not much uh, bee activity, but actually on, on some sunny days or one of our bee species, which is called the buff tail bumblebee, is actually having a winter cycle. Now, it started to do that for about the last 20, 25 years. The reason it's doing that is because we're having much milder winters. 
um, due to probably climate change. And we are also planting a lot more food in our outdoor spaces. So a lot of those queens, instead of going to hibernation, have become slightly confused and they're now actually staying out and having a winter month. So we think more of our bumblebee species may start to do this um, as well. We're seeing a trend that they're emerging earlier and earlier each year. So things that we can put in our gardens or any outdoor spaces are um, the alpine uh, winter heathers. We can also put in things like winter honeysuckle, mahonia, uh, gorse as well, if you've got a space, and obviously things like snowdrops as well. And snowdrops should actually be planted out as bulbs uh, in the next few weeks um, if you'd like to get them uh, flowering uh, for, for yourself uh, next winter. Going on to spring, this is when we can have a lot more variety of different things as well. So I've mentioned the long walk, the Pullman area, fantastic early forage for the bees. Flowering current is very good. If you've got space or an outdoor recreation area, uh, the willows are also very good. Herbs are also um, great things to have. So anything like rosemary, sage, mint, thyme tend to need less water in as well. So if we do get a drought in the southeast, a lot less rain. Um, these are good ones to have in your garden. You don't have to water them as much. If any of your allotment holders as well, these can be the perfect areas for our bees. So particularly they will have normally a continuation um, of forage with all your vegetable and fruit crops. Apple blossom very early on is very good and other things like bugle as well. One of the single best forage for our bee species at this time of year is the humble dandelion. Now, the poor dandelion um, gets a very rough name and is called a weed, but it is a beautiful essential flower um, for many of our insect pollinators and many of our solitary bees feed exclusively on dandelions. Our bumblebees will use them um, as well and also the honeybees and a variety of different other insect pollinators. So if you do have an outdoor space, do leave some of those dandelions because they are perfect, perfect for our pollinators and they're free as well. They just come up in your lawns or outdoor space. Other things as well, crocuses, um, the black fawn is, is beautifully out now, the hawthorn will be out a little bit later, cotoneaster, tiny little flowers but really is very very popular, cherry trees are just coming out now um, as well. Other things as well that you might like in your gardens are native primroses. So do go for the native variety because these are fantastic and they still provide nectar and pollen for our insects. Other things that might appear in your outdoor community spaces, which are fantastic for bees and maybe you might get some coming up in your lawn as well, are the dead nettles. They're not actually nettles, they're of the mint family, so you don't get stung. Um, by them. Uh, brilliant, brilliant forage for our bees and for our particular rare bumblebees, these are excellent forage. Ground ivy and maybe some cowslips as well. So if you do have areas um, around you as well that um, are left a bit wilder or you have a hedgerow, these might be some of the species that you see. Big attractants for our bees as well. But if, you, if they do come up in your garden, not weeds, they are beautiful, beautiful wildflowers. Going then in through uh, later summer, foxgloves comfrey is, is, is excellent. If you have an allotment, you can use it as a mulch as well. Uh, the thistles, so obviously maybe you wouldn't want um, certain thistles growing up, but thistles are always good for our bees, but things like globe thistles, absolutely beautiful, fantastic. Snapdragons, lavender, as I've mentioned before, is excellent. Some flowers, um, again, if many of you have an uh, allotment or even in your back garden, absolutely, again, adored by our bees. Um, strawberries, tomatoes, um, courgettes, runner beans, all of those as well. If you want to grow your own fruit and veg, perfect things for our bees as well. So, Moving on into later summer, some of the ones you might find again along hedgerows or creeping into your gardens are ones called black whorehound, the wound whore, and, and again the dead nettles. Again, fantastic flowers uh, for our bees um, to have uh, in our garden. So having a mixture of our, our wildflowers 
and the ones that you can get from the garden centre, having that continuation of forage throughout the life cycle is so important uh, for our bees. And that's a really easy way um, that you can help our bees. And as I said, on our website uh, at Bee Kind at Bombay Conservation Trust, you can click on all the flowers that you have in your garden. Um, and then gives you a rating, a score and some ideas about what else to plant as well. So if you have a community area, um, if you're walking through any of your local parks, I know you've got the gorgeous Holland Park uh, near you, um, having a look in those areas, seeing what forage is available and what else can be used in these areas. So bigging up our wildflowers as well. Um, so things like clovers, red and white clover, fantastic food resources. Um, other things that you may see around, particularly maybe on brownfield sites or where there's a lot of um, easy drained uh, areas, soils, vipers, bugloss, gnatweeds, any annuals will be beautiful in your garden um, or allotment as well. So corn flowers, poppies, corn marigolds and other things. So anything from the pea family as well, like the vetches, the clover, they fix their own nitrogen. So that basically means um, that they produce very rich uh, pollen, very rich protein pollen um, because they can fix their own nitrogen. So it's very, very good food resource for the bees. So having a mixture of, of wildflowers, by, you can buy these online um, from any, a lot of nurseries are now selling plug plants or seeds of these. Um, but so many more garden centres are actually selling um, a lot of our native uh, wildflowers as well. So do consider putting a few wildflowers into your area as well. If you wanted to create a wildflower patch, so I know in some of your parks as well, there are slightly wilder areas. If you wanted to create literally a, a perennial wildflower area, which is full of flowers like these, an excellent seed to use is one called yellow rattle. It's a hemiparasite of grasses. So it parasitizes their roots and gets all the nutrients it needs from them. And this means it reduces the grass abundance, decreases the fertility of the soil, opens up the grass ward and allows other wildflowers to come in. So grasses will often dominate and swamp out wildflowers. So having uh, a species like this, yellow rattle, perfect one to have in because it dominates uh, those grasses and stops them becoming uh, over, over dominant themselves. So you have to sow this in, in the, the autumn to winter months. It needs frost uh, to break the dormancy, but you can buy plug plants a bit now to pop in as well. So that's the Bee Kind app that I was mentioning, so you can find that on our website. So any area um, that you like to go for a walk in as well, you can see how good an area that is for your bees. Of course, in our garden, they're also great for um, nesting of our bees as well. So again, um, under if you've got a hedgerow, paving stones, rockery, sheds, even a blue tit nest box, compost bin, these are going to be great areas for nesting for our bumblebees as well. So what to do if you do find a nest uh, in your back garden? So at this time of year, we're seeing the queens come out of hibernation. They've got to find food immediately because they've used a lot of her body fat during hibernation. She's going over the surface of the ground and finding somewhere suitable to nest. It would normally be where something's nested before, such as a rodent or a blue tit, and they use that fur for um, feathers, uh, straw and hay to insulate their nests. So they'll be going into and out of little holes. Once she finds that, she'll build a waxy cup, regurgitate her nectar into it and build her pollen together where she will then lay her eggs on top. For the first six weeks of the colony, it is the queen that's going out and foraging. The workers will be developing during that time and once they emerge as an adult, they replace the queen. There are three worker brood cycles within a colony and right at the end of the colony cycle, after about three months, is when the production of males and new queens occur. So first of all, the males are produced and they have to leave that nest. So they will stay outside and they will actually sleep outside and they have a life cycle of about two weeks. So very short lived our males uh, in the bee world. With our queens, they will emerge a couple of days later and they will wait around on different flowering plants and emit a pheromone to attract the males to them. They will then mate with one male. If that's midsummer and one of our most common bees, that queen will go straight into starting a second colony. It's unlikely she will nest from where her maternal nest, the maternal nest she's come from, she will actively look for another nesting site. If this is at the end of the summer, autumn, that new production of queens will go into hibernation 
and they will then emerge the following spring. So the life cycle of a bumblebee is very, very short. It's only on about three, three and a half months. Normally, when you've seen a bumblebee colony in your garden, if you're seeing a lot of activity of workers coming and going, it's at its peak. And normally it only has a couple of weeks left to live. So if they are um, in an area that perhaps is, is slightly awkward or unfortunate, what we do say is please do leave them there. It's a great thing to have bumblebees in your garden. They're obviously finding good resources there and they probably only have a few weeks left to live um, after you've seen them. It's very, very unlikely you'd get stung by um, a bumblebee. The only time you'd normally get stung is if you um, tread on one by accident, so little kids with, with bare feet across the lawn or if they become um, caught in your clothing. So if they feel constricted, that's when they sting but it's very very unlikely you would get stung so we can happily live side by side uh, with bumblebee nests what can you put in your garden so of course we've talking about flowers but we can also put um, lots of things to attract them into nesting and these are great for solitary bees so you can buy these in any garden center or any supermarket six foot high south facing you will get red mason bees and leaf cutter bees moving in. You can also make them yourselves out of old bits of timber, uh, fence posts, bamboo canes. What we say is try to have um, a, a width of about 15 centimetres. That's that's the ideal um, size for them. So yeah, having a, a size of 15 centimetres and again, having them in a south, south facing side is the ideal location for them. Another good thing to have is blue tit nest boxes. Is my is my screen gone funny, Tr Trevor? No, Can you're you... all good. You're all good, Nikki. Oh, phew, because I'm looking at something else and it's gone a bit funny. <laughs> so we're OK. Oh, good. So this is a blue tit nest box here. Now, if you'd like a blue tit um, in the nest box, have it north facing and clean it out over the winter months. If you'd like a bumblebee, in there, have it south, southeast facing, uh, leave the nesting material in once the blue tit is finished, or you can put some of your grass cuttings in there and that will attract uh, them in. So those are little tips that you can do in your gardens to help our bees. Who are you going to then attract in? Well, these are our big seven. So these are our most common bumblebee species that we see. And these ones are able to cope in urban environments. And that's why they're common. They also tend to have two cycles during a year. And the buff tailed at the top left is the one that's having three cycles per year. So at the moment, we're seeing our queens coming out. Those are our biggest, as I said, about an inch or so big. The workers will start to be emerging soon and they tend to be half the size or even a third the size of the queen. And we won't see our males right until the end of the colony cycle. So in about three months from now. So these ones in a good garden um, in London, you will certainly find all of these species. Perhaps you might get a couple of the cuckoo species in as well. So do have a look out for which species that you may have. And we've got lots of resources on our website, Bumblebee Conservation Trust. So a great activity um, to do with the kids or if you if you love going, spending some time in the garden or in any outdoor park as well. Um, as I said earlier, I know you've got the gorgeous Holland Park, but I'm looking up some of the gardens you've got. I'm from, I'm from South London, so I don't know originally the, the Kensington, Chelsea area that much, but I know you've got a lot of lovely parks. So even if you don't have access to a garden, all of these lovely outdoor spaces, you'll be able to see these bees and, and have a look at them and uh, notice where they're going and what they're using for food as well. Um, hi, Nikki. It does seem to be overlaying the slides at the moment. I don't know if you want to restart the PowerPoint. I'm going to unshare and I'll share. Yeah, sorry about that, everyone. Yeah, sorry. I don't know why it's doing that, but we will we'll give it another go. OK, can everybody see that one? Yeah, that looks much better. Thank oh, you. Really? I don't know why it did that. It went funny, but uh, that that's technology, isn't it? But uh, yeah, so as I said, any outdoor space, you're going to get bees there. So um, yeah, do have a look. So allotments are perfect. Obviously, gardens, uh, any community projects that you've got near you and all of those recreational parks as well. I know many of them have wild areas. Some of them will have formal planting. And those are going to be good as well. So so do go out and have a look uh, for our bees. It's supposed to be getting warmer next week as well. So we'll certainly see more bees coming out. 
Now, I just wanted to tell you just before I end about the project that I work on. It's, it's not too far from you. Um, it's in South Kent, East Sussex. So if any of you do um, drive out uh, down to Kent uh, or Sussex, we've got some beautiful um, open areas down here. Um, and traditionally we have um, in Kent, the, the greatest diversity of our rare bumblebee species. But certainly in East London as well, we do actually have the rarest UK bumblebee species. So in areas um, along the Thames estuary is a fantastic area to go and look for bees. So if you were really interested in seeing some rare bees, the North Kent coast, South Essex coast and the East London uh, boroughs are fantastic as well. But Chelsea and, and Kensington, you'll, you'll still have some good ones there as well. So I just want to talk to you about the project I've worked on because it highlights the plight really of what's going on in the UK for our bumblebees. So this is one of our extinct UK species and it's called the short haired bumblebee. And this was last recorded in an area called Dungeness, which is at the very southernmost part of Kent in 1988. Now, prior to its extinction, it was found across the south going up into Humberside. So it was found um, again in East London, going, in, going through into London. Now, during and after the end of the Second World War, we had that agriculture intensification and that's when we lost a staggering 97% of our ancient world flower meadows. That had a massive impact on what we now know as our late emerging species. So from those group of late emerging, um, this is one of the extinct ones and the other ones are struggling at the moment. So a lot of the species that we're seeing declining across the UK are also declining across their native European range as well for exactly the same reasons, loss of habitat. But as I said, Kent is a, a good strong point for it. Um, East London is as well, um, which is fantastic. But we decided to attempt to try and reintroduce this species after it was last recorded in 1988. So to be able to do this, we wanted to recreate and restore habitat on a landscape scale, so connectivity. So we've been talking about continuation of forage and continuation on a landscape. So we can achieve that with gardens in urban areas, with allotments, with, with recreational parks. And that's what we've been doing down here as well by working with a variety of farmers and landowners to restore and recreate flower rich habitat. As we're creating this habitat, we want to know whether it's working. So we go out and we record not just rare bumblebees, but all of our bumblebee species. So we do a national recording scheme, which some of you may be interested in, in doing. And you walk um, an area and you record all the bees you're doing. So for us, we record um, areas where there's particularly good forage, where we've been um, working with the land manager to improve it, and we see how the bees are responding. Most importantly, it's working together as a community. So we've done a lot of volunteer recruitment and a lot of outreach as well within this out, um, area to get local pride in how good this area is for our, for our bees. But by working together as a community, this is how we can really make a change. So this is the area uh, down here. So this is uh, the south of Kent and going into East Sussex as well. So we started back in 2009 on this project, um, which is funded by Natural England, which is a government body under DEFRA, RSPB and Bumblebee Conservation Trust. So by 2012, we wanted to have a minimum of 100 hectares. Now, if you think of a hectare, it's about the size of a football pitch. So I'm a Crystal Palace fan, so I'm it's probably not, a bit unfortunate for me to think of football at the moment. We're not doing so well. But if you think about the size um, of a football pitch, that's that's one hectare. And we wanted 100 hectares across this area for connectivity. So we work with a variety of farmers, um, given advice on hay meadow restoration, uh, pollen and nectar mixes around arable fields. We work with a lot of nature reserves. We also improve the cutting of the bee roads down here. So a lot of those country roads and a lot of sea walls as well. But we've worked a lot with our, our local councils, parish councils and Kent County Council as well. So it's so important to work with our, our councils um, and, and look at monitoring um, and cutting regimes there as well so we can improve the diversity. So first of all, we worked on the first 10 to 15 uh, kilometres surrounding the area and we've since branched out from there. 
But over the course of these 12 years, we, we actually work with 50 farmers. Now we split them into two areas, but don't, don't worry too much about that. And with these farmers, we've actually advised now collectively on over 1,500 hectares. So this is giving bespoke advice to farmers on how to manage, maintain, recreate and improve floristic diversity, um, floristic abundance. So how many flowers there are, the diversity, the, number, the amount of species you have and that continuation of forage throughout the landscape scale. We've also worked with a variety of different landowners um, as well as so the small holdings, churchyards, amenity areas, nature reserves, outdoor parks, anywhere can be um, worked with and any type of habitat you have we can always put something in that's going to be good for the bees. So no matter what garden you have, no matter what outdoor space you have, something can always be put there to help them. So with those, we've actually advised on just um, under 450 hectares. Um, and well, we combine that with the other project, it's, it's over about 600. And we also advise uh, Kent County Council on their cutting regime of their roads as well. And we've actually improved the cutting regime on over 64 kilometres. So instead of those frequent cuts, we're now just cutting it once a year at the end of the season in October. So in total, we've advised and improved on over 2000 hectares um, of habitat. So some of this is complete restoration. Some of it is allowing natural regeneration because the seed bank's always good. And some of it is changing the cutting and grazing regime to increase the flowering season. We also do lots of our own habitat work as well. So with groups of volunteers, charity work party days as well. So every little bit that we can do is gonna help. And that, that's the same for everybody, no matter where you are. So we do lots of monitoring and perhaps this might be something that some people are interested in um, as well. So we do surveys. Now at Bumby Conservation Trust, we have um, a national survey scheme called Bee Walks. And I'll talk about this just at the end as well. So this is a fixed survey that you do um, between March to October and you walk a fixed route somewhere where you like to walk and you record the number of bumblebee species and the forage plants that are there as well. So we're so interested in having this anywhere in the UK and we're very interested in London boroughs as well in urban areas to see what bee species are there and how they're doing. We also do uh, wildflower surveys early, mid and late so we can see what flowers um, are there, what is the forage season like and where are the gaps. So if there's not a lot of forage um, late April, that's what we need to do. We need to create more that are flowering in that time. So over the course uh, of the project, we've of course recorded uh, increased recording, but we do believe due to the project's intervention over a landscape scale during this 12 years, we have actually increased rare bumblebee numbers. Now there are species called the brown banded moss and the rudral, and all of these are showing a strong increase. We believe this is now um, the best place in the country for one of our very rare bumblebees, the rudral bumblebees. And we've also recorded um, our five, some of our five rarer species in areas we've not seen them for between five to 25 years. It's just showing that if you do create the habitat, they will use it, they will return to those areas. It really is a solution of planting more flowers for them across a landscape scale, um, whether that be in our gardens, uh, in our parks to help these bees. Also, our most common species have um, also increased. The one that hasn't is our, our most common UK species, the buff tail, it's called Bombus terrestris, but it just shows that over that time, bees do respond and, and we can really help their populations. And of course, by restoring this habitat, if you did want to create a, a wildflower area, um, whether this be um, in a, a recreational area, uh, working with farmers, it is the restoration of an ecosystem that's also largely been lost. So using bumblebees as a flagship can really help these other species as well. So just to talk briefly about the, the reintroduction part of it before I end. So across the whole of Europe, this bee, the shorthair bumblebee, is declining. It's rare, it's extinct. Sweden and Estonia are the only two countries it's actually doing well. So back in 2011, I asked the Swedish bumblebee expert Bjorn Sederberg if we could come to Sweden and collect some queens. So they are mated before they go into hibernation. He agreed and we go to the very southern province, which is called Skuna. And here there are two transults on the um, west coast and on the south coast. And between 2012 and 2016, we collected a maximum of 100 queens per year. These queens were then placed uh, into quarantine 
for two weeks and any that were diseased or parasitized were not released. Now of all queen bumblebee species, 50% of them will naturally have diseases and parasites and will die within the first 10 days of emergence. So we released over 200 and we just decided to let them fly and decide where they wanted to nest and where they wanted to forage. So we did just let them go, but of course that can mean it's very difficult to find them again. So these are the releases that we did and we invited along local farmers, volunteers to release their own queen as a thank you for what they've done. Now, sadly, this is probably the part of the project that hasn't had the most success. So during the releases, we did see evidence of establishments of, of workers production. But since 2016, we've, we haven't had any more confirmed records. They are quite a difficult bee to ID compared to other ones. Um, it could be that putting them in quarantine for two, two weeks um, reduce their, their fitness because normally during that time they'd be looking uh, for a nesting and starting to forage up um, and, and redevelop their, their ovaries during this time. Of course, we did, we did feed them during this time, but they obviously couldn't find nesting locations. So a reasonably small number of, of queens were released over those time, but of course we are having a large focus in trying to look for them this year. But one of the thing, the thing, the key message is that let's not let any any further um, species become extinct. It's very hard to try and reintroduce a species once it's gone extinct. So by creating and maintaining habitat um, and restoring it is a key thing to helping these bees. We also do lots of outreach as well. So this is um, mainly across Kent and Sussex, but I do give talks over into Essex. I do come up into London as well, particularly during the autumn um, and winter. Um, and we do do lots of talks there to interested groups. So what we're trying to do is spread the word um, about our bees with a variety of different audiences. And during the first 10 years of the project, we actually outreached to over 30,000 people. A big part of this is our volunteers as well, who are the backbone um, of this project. It's only me employed on it. So working with the volunteers has been a great help and many of them have stayed with us for those that whole 12 years as well. So in conclusion, we do believe this is the first experiment that's actually shown in Europe that creating habitat at a landscape scale really does increase rare bumblebee populations. So this is something that can be used as a case study across the UK, across the rest of Europe as well. We also have important data on what bumblebees are choosing to visit. So we know um, we're currently analysing this and we can see which are the best flowers that are going to attract the greatest number of bees in. Successful collaboration with farmers and landowners and really we've hoped we've created a a sustainable, resilient project during this time. So as I mentioned earlier, this is something everybody can get involved with. Um, and I know that your, your council are very keen um, for people to go out and do this. You've got lots of lovely um, open spaces there. So this is um, a scheme we have national across the UK. It's called Bee Walk. So it's a monthly transect uh, between one to two kilometres long, walked once a month, March to October, where you pick a route an ideal place that you like to walk. Um, so whether that be in one of your parks, an allotment, uh, taking in some of your neighbour's gardens, you would go along this fixed route each month and you count and record the number of bumblebee species. So it's a national recording scheme um, that can detect populations increases or decreases over time. So it's a great scheme to get involved with and we'd be very interested to see what's in your borough of London. So a quick wee plug before I finish, if anybody is interested um, in going out and having a look at uh, their bees, uh, Bumblebee Conservation Trust, this is our first ever book, it's called Bumblebees and Introduction. Um, it's got all of our UK bee species in there. It also talks to you about gardening for them. Everything that I've spoken about in this talk is in there as well. So you can get that on our web page uh, as well. I think this is one of the best books um, written on bumblebees. I'm totally biased because I did write it um, with some of my colleagues, but it's a great book to have. Um, and if you enjoy looking um, at, at bees in your garden. So that is it um, for me. So thank you so much, everybody, uh, for joining me this evening. Um, people can write to me, uh, my um, email address there. We're also on Twitter and Facebook. That's Project Pacific Ones. But you can also follow Bumblebee Conservation Trust uh, as well. Um, and thank you to Natural England RSPB, who are also our partners within the project. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And um, 
I shall finish it uh, there. Um, so I know you've got Super B Highway that's coming through. So, so Trevor, I don't know if you wanted to, to speak a little bit about this and how, how your borough is getting involved. Um, firstly, Nikki, thanks so much for that talk. That was really excellent, very informative, and we've got lots of good questions to ask in a minute. But okay. yeah, thank you. Um, the B Super Highway is a project the council's running um, throughout this summer just to encourage more pollination hotspots throughout the borough. And they, these series of talks we're doing, and there'll be events and um, hopefully hands on activities to get some plants and seeds into the ground to encourage more pollinator hotspots throughout the borough. So, yeah, look on our website um, through our social media for more events coming soon. And a plug to our next event, which is next. Thursday when Erica from the Natural History Museum will be talking about um, flies and the importance of them as pollinators. But thank you Nikki again because that was really good. Um, are you okay to answer some questions? Yeah, no that sounds great. Let's, let's go for it. So I'll go for as many as I can to everyone. I'll probably stop just before um, about quarter to eight. Um, someone asked uh, what are the best wild plants for bumblebees? So the best wildflowers um, for bumblebees, certainly the dandelions um, for our bees at uh, this time of year. My top favourite ones um, are things like foxgloves, our native foxgloves at this time of year, cowslips, uh, 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 cowslips and primroses uh, are very good. The dead nettles are also very good. Then moving into sort of June, July, ones um, such as the clovers, absolutely fantastic to have. Uh, ones that might grow as well in your lawn are things like the ground ivy, the self hill, but any of the flowers that are from the lagoon family, which is the pea family, so those are things like vetches, um, vetchlings, fantastic ones to have in your garden. Other ones like scabious, uh, the knapweeds are very good. Later on into the year, uh, you can have things like black whorehound um, is a very good one to put in um, and also things as well like um, other native ones that, that I can think of if a, a sort of red clover has a long flowering season um, as well but if you have space for, for trees and, and shrubs things like hawthorn blackthorn are very very good willows are also um, very good as well but also the herbs um, as well so lavender um, the mints are very good rosemary those of course are all, all native to us as well and lots of thistles are actually very very good as well so if you don't mind a few thistles those are very good wildflowers as well um, but again if you look on our website there's a there's a big nice long list there of all the things that, that you can you can have and we've mainly focused on um, native species there but you know in your garden do, do the bees mind if they're native or not native no of course they don't but it's it's something obviously we do encourage people um, to, to go for but um, yeah wide variety that we can have bumblebees are a generalist so they will use a wide variety of, of different wildflowers so great to, to hear that people are interested in, in planting wildflowers cool and obviously another quick win is kind of just letting your grass grow isn't it don't, don't mow as often as well. exactly it yeah um it's 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 a, it's a quick win um it's it's probably the most easiest efficient um, and cheapest way to do it is just to allow your grass to grow because often in the seed bank you will have another flower called um, potentially birds foot trefoil so these flowers are coming up they just get um, if you keep mowing they just um, it just suppresses them they can't compete with that and that's why you'll just get grasses but if you reduce your mow and particularly we're coming up to no mow may um, at the moment if you reduce it ideally um, to every couple of months, you'll just allow those flowers uh, to come up and fantastic flowers for bees. They will be native to your to your area, they'll be from your seed bank and it won't cost you anything. Cool. Um, next question, um, are, bee, are bug hotels sorry, beneficial for bumblebees and should they be cleaned out annually? So the the solitary bee hotels homes not not for bumblebees because bumblebees will m the majority of them nest underground in an old rodent hole and they grow to about the size of a small football um, so those are your, your bumblebees will often go in a blue tint nest box uh, but you might find them in compost if you've got again a hedgerow uh, under a shed um, if you've got a rockery those kind of areas you'll find them for the solitary bee homes. Um, Again, you can make them yourself. If you have a variety of diameters from two to eight millimetres, you'll get a variety of different solitary bees moving in. Um, you can create these out of a log pile. 
you can you can buy them in supermarkets um, in garden centres as well or you can have them in bamboo canes so you need to be south south facing um, to, to get the bees in now there's different theories about whether you should clean them out or not so you do get a higher predator load so there's quite a few um, solitary wasps that will predate on on many of the eggs of these solitary bees for me personally i find that's a natural thing and that's a natural part of it and um what what will happen after about three to five years is they will no longer nest in that one so you might want to just let it go for its season and put a new one up next to it and they'll start to use that so after a certain time normally between three to five years they will stop using that original um home and they'll, they'll they'll move on to a new one. So I would regularly um, swap them every every three years um, or so. Um, but I I don't clean mine now. I think let let nature take its course. But it's certainly preference. Um, but you can you can certainly Google that. And there's lots of different ideas about whether you should be storing them um, in a shed or having them cleaned out. And, um, Eric, am I, I'm sorry, Nikki, am I right in thinking sometimes um, bumblebees will overtake like a nest box sometimes as well? They don't tend to take it over because if there is um, a blue tit in there, the blue tit will scare that queen off. It's very unlikely. Yeah. But once the blue tit is finished and the bumblebees go into their second cycle and the new queens are looking for somewhere suitable to nest, they will use an old blue tit nest box. Um, yeah it's the ideal size for them you've obviously got the feathers the straw to keep their nest as insulation there's a particular species called the tree bumblebee and that particularly likes blue tit nest boxes but a lot of our other common species will will use uh, blue tit nest boxes as well so if you'd like a bumble in there have them south southeast facing if you'd like a blue tit have it north facing all right cool um peter darley um asks um, bumblebee queens were very active on the salvias in january how does Available pollen affect hibernation. How does sorry what what affect uh, how does available pollen affect hibernation? So. A lot. Um, so climate is one is a big factor, of course, for for our bumblebees and our other insects, all all wildlife as well. So we did have quite a bit of activity in February. That is the natural time that queens will start to emerge. 